Yeah. All right. So let's get started. I have some demos to do today. Um, this, um, we're going to start chapter 31 today. Um, although I need to do one more problem on um, Ampere's Law. And then I'll start chapter 31. And normally when we're, when we're on campus, this is the most demonstration-driven chapter in the course, but um, I can't do as many of the demos as I would like. I have some, um, although it's very difficult to do this at home, so I'll, I'll do it the best I can with some of these demos. Um, I, I think that the demos, to me, help to illustrate the topics in this chapter, in, in chapter 31. Anyway, I'll get to that in a little bit. So you have, just reminders, Bios of R due Wednesday, the worksheet, um, Wednesday night. I do have uh, student help hours tomorrow, so um, you do have time before uh, you turn it in to ask me questions about the, uh, the worksheet, because I know the second problem might be a little bit more challenging just because of the geometry. The first and the second problem, the process is exactly the same, just the geometry is different. Okay. Uh, chapter 30 is due on Friday. The scope lab is doing the 25th. Um, I don't think you should be having too many problems with this one. Um, exam four is May 4th. And then Thursday uh, in lab, um, I kind of left that day kind of open because it's really hard for me to start the new lab because I haven't covered um, new material. Although I can easily talk about the first part of the lab. So I will decide on Thursday about uh, what I will do. It, it all depends on how far I get today, okay? Um, I might talk about the first part of the lab on Thursday, and then the following Thursday, I'll talk about the rest of the lab. That, that way, I, things get spaced out. And for the next lab, Tyler did create a video, okay, on Canvas. It, it's not on Canvas, but it's on, uh, you, on the YouTube channel. I'll, I'll give you the link to that one. It's on the Sierra College Physics and Engineering YouTube channel. So I'll give you the link to that one um, on Thursday. Um, just a real quick question. If, uh, uh, yeah, I changed it to the 25th. I gave you a little bit of extra time. You guys collecting data for the resistance? What kind of values were you getting for the resistance? The, the, uh, the, the correct term is impedance of the power supply. Anybody say what, uh, have any values? Otherwise, I'll wait till Thursday to ask the question. I was okay. actually going to do this lab right after this okay. class, so it varies. Uh, I uh, it varies at the beginning, but then uh, it does reach an asymptotic value. It's 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 going to be, and it really depends on the. Uh, they're not all going to be exactly the same, but it's in the ballpark of around 50 for higher frequencies. I'll give you that. I'll give that to you guys. But I want everyone to measure it individually because it's going to vary a little bit uh, for each person. So anyway, just give you an idea. So at the higher frequencies, it'll be around 50 in that ballpark. Okay, so um, I want to do another example of Ampere's Law, so just, re just as a reminder of Ampere's Law. If you integrate the magnetic field around a loop, and, and I, let me say something about the notation here. Some people use an L here, and some people use an S here. If you use an S, it's more like linked to an arc length, okay? So you'll see that vary. And this is equal to mu naught times I enclosed. Okay. And this expression is valid for, uh, for any surface that the loop encloses. Okay. For any current that penetrates a surface. It's got to be true for any of them. Okay, because this loop will, will basically enclose an open surface. And so it should, be, it should be true for any open surface. Okay, because whatever open surface you, you attach to that loop, the, the, the current's going to penetrate through it. Okay, 
And regardless of the shape of the loop, less integral has to be equal to me, not I enclosed. Okay? Regardless of the shape of the loop, this integral has to be equal to mu naught times i enclosed. Now, if b is um, constant around the loop, you can pull the b out of the integral, and then you can calculate the magnetic field. And that's what we were doing the other day. We did a couple of examples. We did uh, the wire, which is the obvious one. Um, we did the solenoid, and then we did the thick wire. So I want to do one more, one more example, and it's basically taking the long solenoid and just tying the two ends together so you get something called a torus. So here's an example of what I'm talking about, or a toroid, okay? This is a toroid. So basically, and really this is actually more of a transformer, but the, the way, this one is designed for being a transformer, but let's, I'm just showing you the, the shape of this thing, okay? So imagine you're taking the solenoid and bending it so that its two ends come together. So you have something like this. So inside, of, inside it's empty, it's hollow and you have a wire wrapped all the way around it. Okay, that's not good. I'll do this. It's tightly wound, so let's assume it's, so assume it's tightly wound. Assume it's tightly wound just like the solenoid. And if it's tightly wound, really what happens is the field is completely contained within the donut, the torus. Okay? So in here, if I were to draw an Empyrean loop, obviously I wouldn't draw a circular one. Nothing is enclosed in here and you can show that there's no field here. And then out here, if you draw an imperial loop, you will also get the total current being zero because what will happen is if I draw a loop like this all the way around, these wires will come out of the surface and these, and these wires will go into the surface so they cancel each other out. Okay. I'm sorry, I got a question. Where is the slide of the notes? I'm not sure what you mean, Michaela. Uh, I was just asking uh, if anyone knew if, uh, where can I find that slide? Because I, I can find it in the chapter 30 notes. It's right after the solenoid example. It should be there. Did it not print out? Okay, yeah, no worries. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so... You can show that the field in here is zero using Ampere's law. You can show that the field is zero out here. But then what about the field inside? What does the field look like inside? Well, just imagine, remember the solenoid? The field inside the solenoid was along the axis. If you take this and bend it around, what happens is the field is going to be in this direction or in the opposite direction, depending on the direction of the current. The magnetic field is going to be this way in a torus. And so guess what? Guess what I'm going to choose for my Empyrean loop? What shape should I choose? Circle. I'm going to choose a circle. So I'm going to integrate around this circle. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to calculate the magnitude of, of this. So really what I would do is integrate in the same direction as the magnetic field. Okay, my the direction of DL would be in the, in the same direction. Okay, and if I'm wrong, I'll get a minus sign here somewhere. Okay. So, let's do that. If I choose a loop in this direction, oh, and let me give you some dimensions. Let me give you some of the dimensions of this. Let's call 
um, from, I got too many circles. From here to here, we'll call it big R. Let's say the cross-sectional area is circular. And it's of radius A. So if this is R, this, this location here is R minus 2A. Okay. And I'm going to integrate around this direction, in the same direction as the magnetic field. And so since these are parallel and I'm in, integrating around the loop, and that integral is just going to give me this. And R is just some arbitrary distance from the center. This is going to be equal to mu naught to whatever is current is enclosed in that loop. So these currents are penetrating this surface, all of them, all n turns of them. And so there's going to be n wires penetrating the loop. So then B is mu naught n i divided by 2 pi r. This one, in this particular case, the magnetic field drops as 1 over r in this region. If I were to plot the magnetic field as a function of r, you would have 0 up to uh, this distance, which is r minus 2a, it would jump up, decrease as 1 over r, and then go to 0 at r. So that's what the field would look like. Questions on this? So we are considering extremely thin wire? Yeah, extremely thin and tightly wound. Okay. Yeah, so we're, we're assuming very many, many turns. The A again uh, is the, basically, this, let's assume this is a circular cross section. And so the radius, so if you look at it from, if you were able to cut this donut like that, then you would see a circular cross-section, its radius would be A. Is that okay, Chase? Okay. And normally, and, and normally um, when we work with these, when we do problems with these, at least at, in, at this level, we actually make the cross-section rectangular. When we get to chapter 32, I'm going to do a calculation with one of these and make the um, cross-section cross -section rectangular because it makes the math easier. Okay. All right, other questions on this one? So if the wire was not thin, then we would have magnetic field inside the toroid, or would we still not have it inside? Well, we'd have some inside and outside. It probably wouldn't be as uniform if, if, if the wire, if it wasn't wound as tight. No, like if the thickness was higher. Oh, the thickness of the wire was? Yeah. Um, yeah, at some point, and I, I couldn't tell you where, I mean, off, off the top of my head, at some point the thickness would probably play a role, you know, how thick it is, would probably, would, could play a role in it. I mean, it, in terms of how it would wind around the, the torus. Yeah, I was simply thinking like if we have like the circle in the center inside the torus and you um, increase its radius, um, if the wire is not extremely thin, then there would be current which would penetrate that surface. Yeah, if it was thick enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but like, you know, what I gave you, what I showed you, that thing, that uh, for this one, this was very thin and generally they're designed so that they're very thin. Mm -hmm. 
But that's true is if, if it gets sufficiently thick, and I couldn't tell you where, because um, that would be a tough calculation. There would probably be a point where the thickness of the, of the wire is going to cause an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I want to do now is jump to chapter 31. So really, I've done everything I want to cover in chapter 30. I've probably skipped some stuff in the chapter. Um, I really encourage you to read it. There's, because this, this chapter is on sources of fields. And so if you want to know more about ferromagnetism, paramagnetism, diamagnetism, read the chapter. I just don't have time to, to go through that. And it's really, you know, I just, I guess I guess to pick and choose what I want to uh, discuss in the chapter. So um, I'm kind of not really, I'm kind of skipping some of that material, but I think it's still worthwhile reading through it in the book. Okay, so I think that the next chapter to me is probably the most interesting chapter in the course. So let me change PowerPoint notes. I did email you the PowerPoint notes, but then I noticed there's some, some, something weird happening in my PowerPoint notes. So I'm going to have to correct them and send them to you and, um, again, but at least you have something for now. Professor? Yes. So uh, the magnetic field is zero on the toroid itself. You mean on the, on the outer surface? Yeah, on the outer and the inner surface, right? On the inner surface, it's not. Or if you're inside, uh, it's really up to the center of the wire, up to the center of the wire carrying the current. The field is non-zero all the way up to the center of the wire carrying the current. But of course, you'll get distortion of the field once you, once you penetrate the surface of the hollow material that's holding the wire in place. So really, mm -hmm. that, that's not shown here. Okay. But of course, that, you know, and that's only important if, if you need to be that exact uh, in manufacturing your field. And, and really... That's not a big issue. If, if you're designing something to confine particles within the, uh, the torus, that, that transition from here to here, is, it's hard to tell in this picture, uh, it won't play, it's not gonna play a big role. Mm -hmm. As long as your field is uniform in here, and it won't be zero until you really get uh, on the other side of this wire. Okay. Okay. All right. So the, this next chapter, um, I, like I said, it's, I think is the most interesting chapter in the, in the course because it has many applications in, in real life. All right. And it's on Faraday's Law. So um, I'm going to do a demonstration for you. Hopefully you can see it okay. I, mean, I can use my other camera, but I'm, I'm kind of concerned with the way I have things set up. So... Can you all see this? And maybe, I, let, me, let me maybe zoom in a little bit, but when I zoom in, it's gonna get a little bit blurry. Oops, that's not what I wanna do. Okay, can you guys see this okay? Can you see the needle on it? Yeah. Or is it hard to see the needle? A little bit. It depends on the background of it. Okay, maybe. So it's probably hard to see the needle like this, right? Yeah, it, it was better before. Okay, so maybe, let me get a binder. See, normally I, I, I use a big... Uh, device to uh, illustrate this, but hold on a second. Well, when I'm at home, it's much more difficult to do some of these demos. Let me get rid of that PowerPoint slide, too. Okay. So, 
That's too hard to see, right? That is like blind. Okay, all right. Let me go to the other camera then. Because I, I kind of want you to be able to see this. Just the other camera, I have another experiment set up. All right, let me, let me go to the other camera. In fact, let me do this. Let me, um, I'm going to keep the microphone plugged in. Okay, that's not what I want you to see. Oops. So can you see that? You guys can see that nicely, right? Yeah. So what I have is a, uh, basically a multimeter and I have some coils. I'm going to take a magnet and run it into the coil. What do you notice? Deflection. You notice a deflection. So that means I have current. I'll do it, I'll do it through, for the other coils. Notice this one doesn't deflect as much. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between these coils? The top one Sorry. and the bottom one. What is it? The size of them. Yeah, there's, there's more turns on the bottom than there are at the top, so I actually get a bigger deflection, so I get more current. Mm -hmm. So I have current, I have current running through this thing. Uh, I don't have any bar, power supply. Where's the energy coming from? You are changing the magnetic field. I'm changing it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so, but I'm, but, you, but you're saying I'm doing the work, right? Yeah. So the energy is coming from me. The energy is coming from outside the system. So if the system consists of the magnet, uh, the magnet itself, and the coil, then the reason why I'm I'm getting current is because I'm doing the work. I'm providing the energy. So that's interesting that, it, that a changing magnetic field, because the, the coil experience a changing magnetic field, gives you a, a voltage. So that's an important thing, and that was an experimental discovery um, by Faraday. Let me change cameras. Oops. That was an important uh, experimental discovery by uh, Faraday, that if you run a magnet through a wire, I'm sorry, if you run a magnet through a coil of wire, um, you'll have a current that's induced. And the direction of the current depends on um, whether or not you bring the magnet into the coil or pull it out of the coil, or whether the north side of the, or the, or the south pot side of the pole goes into the magnet or out of the magnet. And so the picture you see there shows the two cases where the north polar magnet goes in and the, south, and the north polar magnet goes out, and the current changes directions. And then if you hold the magnet like still in there, will there not be any current? Nothing happens. You only get current that's induced when the magnet moves. Oh, okay. Okay. And so that means that when you're running the magnet through the wire, there must be a potential difference across the ends of the wire. And so the, the loop behaves as if like some sort of electromotive force, some power supply was connected to it. And so we say that an, an EMF is induced. When I run the magnet through the wire, an EMF is induced. And again, you should just notice that the direction of the induced current depends on the velocity vector, and it also depends on which end of the magnet goes into the coil first. 
if I move if if I move it faster, I would get a, a bit a larger deflection. If I move it slowly, I would get a smaller deflection. And if I change the direction, the direction of the current would change. So what affects the induced current or the EMF that's produced, the electromotive force? Well, there are several things, and you can and this that can be shown experimentally. One, the rate in which the external field changes. So if I move the magnet through the coil much more quickly, the coil is experiencing a, a faster change in the magnetic field. If I change the area of the loop exposed to the wire, That changes the EMF also. If the magnetic field in the air of the loop don't change, then no EMF is induced. All right, because if I hold the magnet in, inside the coil, it just sits there, nothing happens. It's boring. Okay. So let me show you how this depends on the area exposed to the loop. So I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to switch cameras again. Okay, so what I have here is my um, two-channel oscilloscope. I have, and this part, let me turn it, this on, the camera on. I have here a coil of wire with a current running through it. So this part, the signal generator is connected to the, this coil. So I'm running a, a square pulse into the coil. I have a second coil right here, and I'm going to put it near the first coil. There's the first coil. It's producing the magnetic field. It's producing a changing magnetic field. Okay. It's hard to arrange my camera so you can see both the coil and the um, let's try this. The coil and the uh, oscilloscope. I have very little room here. So what I'm going to do is take this coil, I'm going to call this my detector coil. This is like the, this, this is going to act like the multimeter. And I'm going to measure the voltage across this. Where do you notice the voltage? Where do you notice the non-zero voltage? That's the orange. The orange is the voltage. What do you see? It's along the spikes of the square. Yeah, so what does that mean where well, you have the, the spikes of the square? What does that mean? I mean, it's spiking up like where the, the rectangular um, graph goes up and down. Yeah, and, and what that means is the current is changing, right? Yeah. And it means the magnetic field is changing. So you only see... You only see it when the magnetic field changes. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to rotate the coil. So the field lines in this, in this uh, magnet essentially go either into here or towards us. So if I hold my other coil like this, all the field lines that are produced, that are... Um, let me rephrase that. Uh, this is catching all the field lines going through it. If I rotate this by 90 degrees, no field lines are going through it. What do you see in the, what do you see in the scope? No. Nothing. No field lines penetrate that loop, so you get nothing. Mm. Okay. I rotate it back. You see everything. So, so. The induced EMF depends on the angle between this loop, which is detecting the voltages, and the magnetic field vector. Okay, look at that. 
And in fact, if I flip it by 180 degrees, the spikes change directions. What trig function do you think is involved there? What trig function is zero at 90 degrees? Sine. Cosine, right? Sine. So somehow the cosine is involved in this. Do you all see that? What's nice about the square pulse is you can easily see um, when, it, when the EMF is induced, right when you get a transition. Okay. And here's another thing. Maybe, maybe you can figure out something. I'm going to change this to a, uh, a sine function. Let me turn this off. I gotta change the frequency. So there, there's, there's, this demo is not as easy as you might think, because there's other issues that come up in trying to get this to work. So I actually have to do this at the right frequency. You will learn, you will learn about them in, in the next ch uh, chapter three too. The issues that, that come up. Okay, I gotta change the time base. So here I, I am putting in a sine function. 3,000 hertz. So this is the magnetic field. The magnetic field has this, this form because the current varies sinusoidally with time. So I'm going to put the coil, I'm going to put this coil now inside. And let me change the scale. What do you notice? What trig function is, how's the, how do the trig functions compare? Do the peaks come at the same time? They're off by 90. They're off by about 90 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're off by 90 degrees. All right, so let me, let me go back and Unplug my camera. Let's go back to the microphone. Oops, I don't know what happened there. That's very strange. Okay, hold on a second. Is the view a little bit blurrier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I can do anything about that. Hold on a second. I might be using too many resources. Sorry, I apologize for that. Darn, okay, sorry about that. So this phenomenon that we are observing was independently um, observed by Michael Faraday and Joseph Henry, but Faraday got the credit for it. Okay, and so it's called Faraday's Law. And so let's talk about what this expression means. Let me write it on the board. Let me write this expression on the board, what Faraday's law is. This cannot be derived. This is something we experience just like Newton's second law, okay? So the induced EMF, and really we shouldn't use the letter V because this is physically different from a voltage that we would talk about in circuits. Looks like the opposite of a DC motor. You're yeah, you're, you're, you, this would form the basis of a generator. You're right. And I will, Thursday, I will, uh, I'll use that motor I used the other day and uh, convert it into a generator. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people will write it like this, the induced EMF. 
instead of a voltage. And the reason why, because fundamentally, this voltage, this is different than like the voltage that you learn, the voltage that you would learn um, in like in chapter 28. So we say that this induced EMF is minus the total time derivative of the magnetic flux through the loop. So this is Faraday's law. So Faraday's law says that the induced EMF is minus the time derivative of the magnetic flux through the loop. Okay. The minus sign is attributed to someone named Lenz. So we'll talk about Lenz's law in a minute. Okay, the, the, the minus sign has to do with conservation of energy. So really, this is attributed to both uh, Faraday and Lenz. And, and again, this is, has to do with conservation of energy, and we'll get to that. And again, phi sub b is the magnetic flux through a surface enclosed by the loop. So in my examples... Um, we're talking about this surf, the surface through here, this little, this little coil. We're talking about the surface going through here that's enclosed by our loop that has, this loop has 2,000 turns in it, okay? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the flux through here. Or in, in these particular cases, we're talking about the flux that's penetrating through either this loop, this loop, or this loop. And you saw how it de depends on angles. So this is, this is where the dot product comes in, right? B dot N, okay? Remember when I had the, the, uh, the loop, the normal to the loop perpendicular to magnetic field, this was zero. Because the dot product was zero. And if I flipped, if I flipped, the coil, the little coil by 180 degrees, this stop product ended up being negative one. Okay? Does everyone see that? Mm -hmm. There's a lot to this. this is, there's a lot to this expression. So I want to say something regarding how this topic is covered. Because the, the math can be a little bit challenging, um, usually textbooks kind of cover this piecewise. They, they, piece they either do what I just did and just show this to you right away or they start with a, um, a different effect, which I'll get to second. So um, it, it turns out that this can be explained with two different laws. It's a weird thing in physics. It's one of the few things that, where this effect can be explained to, in two different, way, uh, two different ways. Okay. Now, there's a video that I was looking at the other day, a guy from Yale. He does a very elegant way of covering this topic. He doesn't do a lot of demos, but it's, it's very self-consistent. But the drawback is uh, some of his derivations might be a little bit beyond the scope of this class. I did put the videos in the module for you to look at, but he, he, um, he does give, it's, to me, it's an elegant way of presenting the ideas, but it might be a little challenging. Sometimes you, you give something, in a, present something in an elegant way, but it might be challenging for the students to understand it, okay? A lot of times the way it's done in the book is kind of like um, done to avoid the difficulties encountered with the math. So let's... The, the presentation might be a little bit choppy. And mine will be too, probably. Because I'm trying to do the same thing. Okay. So, one of the things to, to note that in the examples I've done so far, with, with the example with the magnet, um, you should get the same result 
whether the north pole of the magnet moves into the coil or the coil moves towards the north pole of the magnet because the laws of physics have to be the same in all reference frames. It, it turns out that this law is actually relativistically correct. Okay, this law is actually relatively, relativistically correct. And you'll see that when I talk about the two different ways this, this comes about. Imagine I, and, and, okay, so this is a demo I do in class usually, but I can't do it here. So imagine I have a battery connected with a wire wrapped around a piece of iron, like you see in the figure. And the, and the battery, the, the left side of the circuit has a switch in it too. On the right hand side, you have wire wrapped around the other side of the iron and the galvanometer, which is used to detect current. You actually have two separate circuits. What do you think happens when I flip that switch? The meter will deflect on the galvanometer? The meter, and the, le the meter will deflect because when you close the switch, what happens? There is current through the wire which produces magnetic field in the ring that induces current in the other wire. That is correct, but it only happens when you make the switch, when you switch, right? Yes. Once the current is established, that's it, nothing else happens. So once you mm -hmm. flip the switch, then you have a changing magnetic field, and the other circuit senses that change in magnetic field. In fact, all the field lines go through that iron. And so whatever is going through the primary side is going through the secondary side. Does anybody, can anybody think of what that looks like? The the iron core with the two um, wires wrapped on around on either side. One's called a primary, one's a secondary. Transformer? Yeah, this is, that's really a simple, a simple transformer. And really, what I showed you early, this torus, is really a simple transformer. Okay. Transformers work on this idea. And we'll talk about transformers when we get into chapter 33. Okay, normally I do this demo. But because of, it's just too hard to do it in, in my little room here. But I, I can do another demo. And of course, when you're in person, this one's more dramatic. So let me, I'm going to have to change, I got to zoom in for you guys. Y'all see that magnet? This is a big, powerful magnet. Yeah. Okay, it's a little blurry, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna turn the lights down a little bit. You can, oops, you can still see it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I have in my hand is a loop of wire with the flash bulb connected to it. You know the flash bulb I used earlier this semester with, for um, the capacitor? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have that. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this through here. Now it's gonna be a little difficult because this piece up here is, mag is magnetic. And so sometimes when I run it through, my hand gets, this thing gets attracted to that magnet. All right, so let's try it real quick. Let's see if I can get it to work. Okay, here we go. You see it? You see the flash? Yes. Okay, it's much brighter when you're in person. And this thing is smoking. I mean, this thing, I mean, this thing was, I mean, this thing was really smoking. There's a lot of smoke in here right now. But that, but, the, but you get to see, I run, I, I generate a big enough voltage, so there's a big enough current through here to make this thing go off. Okay. Like I said, this is more fun. This demo is more fun in person. I still see blue and I still see blue. Okay. So I want to ask a question on this topic. Suppose I have I'll re, I'll leave that up there. Suppose I have the following
I have a magnetic field, so I have some sort of solenoid that produces a magnetic field into the board. Okay? And then I have wire like this around it. Well, let's put let's put a light bulb here. Can you shift the camera a bit? Oh, sorry. I'm zoomed in too much. And again, I apologize for how blurry it is. Is that better? I mean, it's not that great because it's blurry, but... Let me put a bulb over here. I know it's not as good as the picture in the PowerPoint notes. Okay, so this is a bulb. Okay. And let's say the magnetic field increases into the board. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your guys' question about the, the smoking. Yeah, because the filament lit, um, it, it just burned. And it, a lot of energy was dumped, and so this thing was smoking. So you guys were able to see the smoke. I didn't realize that. Okay, so let's say the, the field increases into the board. Okay. I would love to demonstrate this, but you need a pretty good field and the right light bulbs to be able to do this. So the field um, increases into the board. Both lights are on, right? Let's say the field is big enough and it changes fast enough so that both light bulbs go on. We okay with that so far? Now, what happens if I take a wire and connect them between these two points. This is point Q, and this is point P. What happens? Does nothing happen? Do both lights go off? Does one of them go off? Does one of them go off? Which one, though? I don't know. So, Chase, you're saying the one on the left goes off? Aren't they still in parallel? Aren't they now in parallel? Not in series anymore? So they're both getting the same voltage across them? Well, does it depend on the direction of the current? Well, let's think about... How many loops do you see there? There's three loops, right? There's this loop. So I'm going I'm to use green for the different loops. Um, so so this is loop one, right? What's the second loop? Let's call this two. What's the third loop? The two bulbs. I'm sorry? The two bulbs. The two bulbs. Okay, so you have two, two bulbs. So you have three loops. One with this bulb, one with this bulb, and then one with both bulbs. Now, let's take a look at loop one.
Is there a changing magnetic flux through the loop through the area enclosed by the loop? Is there a changing magnetic flux through the area enclosed by loop one? Are there field lines going through here? Where are the field lines, Chase? Where are the, the X's are over here, right? There's no X's here, right? There's no field lines here. I didn't draw any field lines here. The field line, the field's right here. So there's, there's nothing through loop one. There's no changing field. In fact, there's no field for loop one. Is there a changing field through loop three? And in fact, isn't there a changing field through loop two and loop three? Yes. Okay. But what's the difference? What's the difference between loop two and loop three? Is there more current in one? There's lower current in, um, let's just say there's a, a lot higher current in one of them, which one? The one with only one bulb and yeah. the conductor wire. Yeah, so loop two has less resistance. Doesn't the current tend to take the path of least resistance? Mm -hmm. so, so it has two choices. It can either go like this, or it can go like this. It's going to want to go around the path that's easiest. So it's going to choose loop. It's going to choose loop... Uh, which one did I number it? It's going to choose loop two because it has less resistance. And professor? Yes. Did we um, not consider the magnetic field that is produced by the wires themselves because it is constant? Or it's like, not really constant, but, but it's going to be small. So we neglected it? Yeah, so we neglect it. We just neglect that, that field because the field due to the solenoid is going to be way higher than the one that's induced. Is that really hard to read? I apologize. In order for me... Hmm. Can I restart the camera software? You guys give me a second, I can restart the camera software. Maybe I'll get it. I'll figure that out. I'll, I'll deal with that later. I just, I'll just join the two videos. It, it won't look nice, but whatever. Okay, so there we go. So what will happen is, since it chooses loop 2, only this one stays on. So what are you confused with, Chase? Okay, I can't, it's, it's hard for me because I can't see all of them. 
we're, uh, we're just ne neglecting the field due to these wires, because, produced by these wires, because number one, they're acting, they would be acting on themselves, and number two, they're, they're small compared to this field. They're always going to be small. Okay. Um, I mean, this, this one's going to pr produce a much larger field. If, if this wire was, had like a lot of wrappings, a lot of, you know, like a thousand turns, if this was a thousand turns, then yeah, you might have to worry about that effect. Okay. There's, a, there's, a, there's an effect called inductance. I mean, that's something we'll talk about in chapter 32, but we're going to, for our purposes, we're going to assume that, that that effect is small. Okay, compared to what's producing it. All right, so this one will go on. So somebody last semester asked me the following question. Okay, this is, a, this is actually a hard question. What if I take this loop, the, the, the red wire, and I lift it out of the plane? What happens then? If I, as I go from here to the other side, if I take this red wire and then I flip it to the other side, what will end up happening is that one will go on and this will go off. So there's going to be a location where they're both on. As I flip this, there's going to be a location where they're both on. I, I wish I could demo this. Okay. And then when you move this to the other side, that one will be on and this will be off. So just to show you the effects of these fields, um, I don't have as dramatic a demo, but I have a YouTube video that Tyler created for us. So uh, let's go to the, I'm going to go to the YouTube video. Again, I'm going to switch windows. Now pay close attention to this video. Here's a quite interesting demo to take a look at today. And this is consideration of how magnetic fields can affect a circuit. Here is a PASCO multimeter, which we're measuring the voltage induced across. Follow the circuit with me. Go to the back end. And in between, we have a 250 turn labeled coil with an iron core attached to a variac. So as I turn on the variac, we can see the magnetic field here is inducing a voltage. But we move the wire behind now, we can take out most of that magnetic field and reduce the voltage on it. And back, and forth. To get to see the effect of flipping that coil, or that wire. So for a demo... In Sorry. Okay. Any other questions on that? All right. So the question is, we're inducing an EMF in a circuit, in, in a loop of wire. What's causing the charge to move in the wire? Magnetic field can't do it. I'm sorry, did somebody say something? I'm sorry. Magnetic field came to work on, on the charges. So magnetic field is not moving those charges to produce the current. Like when the flash bulb went off. The only possibility is that there's an electric field that's generated. So when I, I have a changing magnetic field, it induces an electric field. And that's what causes the electrons. 
That's what's going to make the electrons move. The integral of the electric field around the loop results in your uh, delta V induced and then the current if you have a closed loop. So rea in, in reality, this has to be equal to the integral of the electric field around a closed loop. Anything bother you about that? Anything troubling about that? It should. The question is why? Why, would, why should that trouble you? Because when we did Kirchhoff's laws, what do we say about Kirchhoff's laws? You guys remember what we said about Kirchhoff's laws? Why do they exist? Why, why do Kirchhoff's laws exist? Kirchhoff's laws exist because of this. The integral of the electric field around a closed loop equals zero. No, it's not. Why? What does this say? In fact, this electric field exists even if there's no charges present. Then if you put a charge in the vicinity of this field that's due to no charges present, it's going to experience a force. If you integrate this electric field around a closed surface, in other words, if you apply Gauss's law, the integral has to be zero. The reason why this should bother you is because for Kirchhoff's laws, this integral is zero. Here it's not. That's because this electric field is non-conservative. This field is. You cannot, you cannot say this anymore. You can't say that. That's wrong. Okay, actually, the electric field consists really of two terms now. It's this plus a second term. We can't talk about the second term in this class. Okay. Questions? How did the field become non-conservative here? How did this become non-conservative as opposed to in this case? Yeah. Well, where's the energy? Where does this energy come from? From us? It came from us. It came from outside some outside source, right? Yes. Okay. So some some that's a good question. Some outside entity has transferred energy to this system. That's why it's not conservative. Okay. Okay. Anytime you tra energy is transferred between the system and the environment, then something non conservative is happening, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. But but then the other the big thing here is you cannot say this anymore. You cannot say E is minus the gradient of potential. It, it turns out that E has to have another. It, it turns out that there's a second term here for E that we can't discuss in this class, but I'm just telling you that, okay? You just need to know that you can't say this anymore when you have a non-conservative electric field. Okay. Furthermore, since this is gonna be true,
since this is true, and this kind of measures, this dot product, this integral measures the way, uh, uh, is a measure of how something circulates, and this is not zero, the electric field circulates just like the magnetic field. This induced field has the same mathematical properties of the, the uh, magnetic field, because you know the magnetic field has this property. All right, Gauss's law for magnetic fields. This, this is always zero. This, is, this has to be true. So don't expect an electric field in the radial direction. Because otherwise this integral won't be zero. That means there's a charge there. Okay, so this is, these are some big changes now. We have to make some big corrections to... Um, our equations, this is, this is uh, I erased it, but the, the, the big one is that you can't see E is minus the gradient of potential. You can't say that anymore. Okay. So let's try to do this example. And I'm going to, and I'm going to do it in a more of a shorthand way here. I created a video of this where I go through it in gory details. So if you want more details, I'm going to ask you to watch the video. Because I purposely did this one with a lot of details, so it highlights some of some of these some of these things that uh, you'll see here. Okay. So let's say I have a solenoid. And we have a um, a time-dependent current going through the solenoid. Oh, let me erase here. Let me draw my solenoid. Okay, let's say the magnetic field is this way. And let's say I is some function of time, meaning that the current's not constant, the magnetic field's not constant, and so the flux through any loop through here is not constant. Okay, um, I want to know the induced EMF and the electric field inside here. I know that the magnetic field is constant in here. I mean, let me rephrase that. I know that the magnetic field is uniform in here. In fact, the magnetic field for a solenoid its magnitude is going to be mu naught times the number of turns per unit length times I. We derived this the other day. Since this changes with time, this changes with time. It has the same value everywhere in space. Okay. I want to know if I draw a loop inside here or let's say if I put a wire in the shape of a, a loop what is the EMF? What is the voltage induced in that loop? What voltage is induced in that loop? My question is though, do I have to have a physical wire there or can I just draw an imaginary wire? What do you guys think? Real wire or imaginary wire? It, it turns out this electric field is, actually travels through space. Whether this is a real wire or an imaginary loop, it doesn't matter. That field is still there. If I put a wire there, then what's going to happen is the charges in the wire are going to experience that electric field and the charges are going to move around the wire and you'll get a current in that loop. So I want to, I want to apply Faraday's law. Okay.
I want to calculate the flux through that loop, through the area enclosed by the loop. I'm going to choose the simplest area, just the one in the flat plane enclosed by the loop. I'm going to choose the direction of the normal in the same direction as the magnetic field. Oops, I forgot my time derivative. How difficult is this going to be? What's the dot product between these two? Well, if these two are parallel, the, the, the dot product is going to give me one, and so I'm going to get the following. I won't write that down. That doesn't depend on geometry, that doesn't depend on geometry, that doesn't depend on geometry, I can pull that all out. What's my DA? It's the area of this thing. We'll just call it pi r squared. That's my induced EMF through that loop. But I want to know the electric field through that loop. So what can we say about the electric field? Well, the, electron, the, elect the electrons are going to go around like this, in this loop. The electric field actually has to be, has to circulate tangentially. It cannot have a component in a radial direction, otherwise you won't obey Gauss's law. So this is going to be equal to the integral of E induced dot DL. If the magnetic field is uniform, then this should be uniform around the loop. And so then you're going to get Oh, how did I choose the direction I integrated? Because I can integrate clockwise or counterclockwise. I'm, gonna, I'm going to determine the direction based on the normal to the loop. So if I point my fingers in that direction, I would integrate this way. Okay. And the math will tell me whether I'm in the correct direction or not. And so E ends up being that's the magnitude. So this tells you it's opposite the direction at which I integrated. The minus sign just tells you um, it's opposite the direction at which I integrated. Okay. Questions on this? You folks still there? Yeah. Okay. I haven't heard anybody anybody for a while. Okay. Okay. Good. So are we okay with this? Is this puzzling? Yeah, I'm just sorting everything. Okay. Yeah, this is a weird electric field because it's due to a changing magnetic field. You don't need any charges present. And so if you apply Gauss's law to that field, the integral through a closed surface is always zero. And if you put a charge 
in, inside that solenoid, it's going to experience a force. And that solenoid is and, and that, that charge is going to end up going in a circle because of that circulating electric field. So what does this say about Coulomb's law? Because Coulomb's law says, says this. And, and it says that E is F over Q. This doesn't jive with Coulomb's law because this only really works in... Coulomb's law is only va valid for really the static case. Coulomb's law can say anything about the electric, the time varying uh, electric field. Okay. What if we wanted to calculate the electric field outside a solenoid? So this is for r less than the radius of the solenoid. We'll call the radius of the solenoid big R. What if we're outside the solenoid? Then what? There was no magnetic field. Outside, right? So, so yeah. let's be careful though, because if I draw my loop like this, Okay, there is magnetic field penetrating this, this loop though, right? Just through here. Mm -hmm. So the area is, the area that I integrate over is the area of the solenoid, not the entire area of the loop. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I redo this, so for R bigger than R, for little r, when we do this particular case and our loop is bigger than the radius of the solenoid, then this integral um, I gotta be careful. I mean let me not do it like that. This area is actually the cross-sectional area of the solenoid. And then do it, performing the same integration in the same direction determined by the normal to the loop. And then we say the following. And my loop is of radius r. And so E induced Okay, so I have a video of this where I go through it in a lot more details. And I explain why the electric field has to be, I actually explained why the electric field has to be azimuthal. In other words, in this direction. Okay. So let me say some, let me just say some of the things regarding the properties of this electric field, um, no charges are required to create it. Um, it's math math mathematically described as divergentless, just like the uh, magnetic field. 
These field lines do form closed loop unlike the static electric fields. These field lines, these fields circulate just like the magnetic field. The induced electric field requires a time varying magnetic field. No physical circuit is required for this to happen or to, to experience it. And the resulting induced current opposes the change in flux, which we'll get to. In other words, if you look at this, hold on a second. When we integrated this, we used the right hand rule. That way, but it says that the electric field circulates in the other direction. The induced current produces a magnetic field that way. The induced current, once, what it tries to do is oppose the change in flux. It wants to keep things status quo. And I'm going to make this clear next time when we talk about um, a different way to induce um, EMFs. Since the induced field circulates, it's not conservative. And like I said before, you can't say the electric field is, is the gradient of the potential. There's actually another term you have to deal, you have to, you have to work with. Okay, so I'm going to stop here, and what I'm going to do, and, and I might do this in lab on um, Thursday because I have some time. I might talk about, this is another way we can generate an EMF. This has to do with moving circuits. You can generate an EMF two different ways, either by a changing magnetic field or having a moving circuit. So this is what I'll talk about Thursday, and then at the end of class on Thursday, I can use the extra t the time to answer your questions you may have on the homework. Okay. I know some of this stuff might be a little bit confusing at first, but I think once you start doing the homework problems, um, it's not that bad. The, the material, the homework problems aren't that, aren't super bad. Okay. All right then, so we will see you on Thursday morning in lab, okay? You wanna see the board? Okay, just one second. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna end it here. See you on Thursday.